for tuning in today. I have, as always, I have a special guest. Um, not only a special guest this time, but Jay and I go way back. Uh, we were actually uh, in the same squad, which is a small element of about 10, during our very first military experience in basic training back at West Point years ago. Uh, in another podcast, we might even tell that story. I, I don't know if... Uh, I, I was hoping that we could, Chris. Uh, <laughs> if you didn't mention it, I was definitely going to. Yeah, maybe in the uh, unabridged version, the extended cut, we'll, uh, we'll talk <laughs> about that story. But uh, Look forward but, to it. But Jay, um, and I'll, I'll give you some background. So Jason Warren, um, probably, man, one of the best history minds in the world, best I've ever heard and best anybody I've talked to that's listened to him has heard. Um, he is just a, a walking um, book of knowledge when it comes to, to comes to history. In fact, all those books you're going to see behind him here in the video, he's read all those. That's his library at his house, his study. Um, so let's start. So he, uh, he was coming out, he come out of West Point in 1999, went out to the military police corps, uh, like myself. So we got that in common as well. Um, and then later, you know, I think the army in their, in their wisdom recognized his capacity for higher level strategy and doctrine. And he actually transitioned out of the MP corps and got into, um, that skill set within the army. Um, but along the way, he actually was able to teach at the graduate level for eight years at three different esteemed universities, West Point being among those. Um, he taught at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And actually, he was the first credentialed major to teach there. That is usually reserved for lieutenant colonel and above, but he did it as a major. And he was credentialed, which is an extra step of, um, of credentialing. So, I mean, it's just amazing. He was able to do that. Uh, he's got four books to his name, 60 plus lectures uh, on very specific military history topics and historical topics that relate to practical leadership and strategy that we can apply today. You know, one thing about Jay that I really like is he takes history and he makes it so transitional to what we're doing today. It almost seems like it didn't occur decades and centuries and beyond. It seems like it just happened because he's able to relate it so well. Um, so anybody gets a chance to tune in to, to some of his lectures and things that are available on YouTube and, and other channels, uh, man, I highly recommend it. Pick up his books. I'll link all that stuff uh, somewhere either below this video or within the, uh, the narrative. So, hey, without further ado, let me, and, and Jay, I'm sorry, man, I could spend all time, all <laughs> night here trying to explain everything that you've done. Retired as a lieutenant colonel, by the way, from the military, 20 plus years of service to the nation um, and still serving in so many ways, just in a, in a different uniform. But Jason Warren, thank you for being on the call, buddy. Thanks, Chris. I mean, that, that, that was a really spectacular uh, intro. I um, truly appreciate your friendship over the years. Um, I definitely appreciate your leadership, which I've had a chance to um, witness on multiple occasions. As Chris alluded to, we were uh, squad mates uh, during Beast Barracks, and they call it Beast Barracks for those of you that aren't familiar because it's supposed to be like the devil and really hard, um, to say the least. And uh, one of the reasons I'm standing here is because uh, Chris was my battle buddy and dragged, literally dragged me through tough times on many occasions. And uh, we, like uh, Chris said in the intro, uh, we could spend an entire uh, video podcast uh, just covering some of our... Uh, um, shall, shall we say anecdotes of uh, things that we did as cadets and got away with fortunately in some, in some regard. But, um, you know, so happy to see Chris move on from the military where he had a distinguished career and, um, and do this. And so um, I, I'm totally behind his business, um, which I think is great leadership training to begin with. But then I thought this was extra um, with the whole with the whole COVID crisis, so I watched some of the previous videos that Chris had done with his team, and it made me want to volunteer and try to help out in, in any you know minor way that I could with some of my more humble skills, perhaps, um, and bringing history to to light. Like Chris says, I don't um, think of history or the books behind me as something in, in the remote past that have no lessons for, for us today. 
as I'd often tell my students um, at various levels from the undergrad at West Point to the graduate, um, that history, it doesn't necessarily repeat itself. What, what's happening is human nature that is innate in all of us is reacting in similar ways to, um, uh, to different uh, stim stimuli at, at different times. So basically people are reacting in the same ways over time to similar things. So it's not really history repeating itself. So that's why what I tell you today hopefully will be useful from a crisis standpoint um, of, you know, when we're talking about, in this case, George Washington and his leadership skills during a time of crisis. It was literally known as the crisis. Um, Thomas Paine was one of the famous revolutionary writers who coined that term, or at least is known for writing about this crisis that became very um, popular and is stuck with us in American history. Um, because really, it, it, um, without getting through the crisis, we would not have a country today. And you could imagine a world without U.S. leadership, without U.S. Um, sort of affecting events over the last uh, 250 so years. Um, so because there's so much to talk about uh, with George Washington, multiple books obviously written. Um, in fact, I have my uh, George Washington t-shirt on tonight. I was going to save it as a special surprise at yeah, the end. That, I, I, don't, I hope I didn't ruin it, Chris. But you know. <laughs> um, It's actually Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, nice. Which, famous, uh, famous portrait, right? Fa famous portrait uh, based on the Emanuel Lutz portrait of the mid 19th century, one of the most famous in American history. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today, um, how Washington handled this crisis of uh, losing New York and New Jersey um, to, to the British and their Hessian mercenary allies. Um, and of being from the New York area, you know, and being a, a New York sports fan, I'm especially uh, upset that we uh, had to lose New York and, and Long Island. But uh, oh, unfortunately, we eventually recovered it and uh, we, we uh, know the rest there. But uh, there's um, so before I get started on Washington, I just wanted to um, spend a little bit more time talking about my own um, crisis leadership, just because this is what the series is about and to um, sort of let the audience know. Uh, what perhaps I bring to the uh, table in some ways. So it's hey Jay, good, uh, good, uh, good call. Yeah, I forgot to mention in the beginning. You know, you, you know, I think sometimes we recall our memories. We get carried away. So <laughs> the, the purpose really is to talk about crisis, and we're offering this as a free resource for people. Um, I've interviewed a handful plus of of different categorical es um, experts that I would say just offer something that nobody else in their field does. And Jay is no different in the historical relevance uh, to current conditions world. There's no one better. I'm telling you, he's one of the best in the world. Um, so anyways, that's why we're here. So sorry to steal your thunder there, Jay, but yeah. yeah I'm, glad, I'm glad you uh, did so, Chris. Um, absolutely. So why, um, besides the history portion, I have some real life experiences. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. 20 year, um, army colonel retired, lieutenant colonel retired, um, 20 years and three months, you know, every day counts as we know, uh, you probably know the days too, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> June 28th, 1995 to one August, 2019. Nice. Just because question. But, uh, so um, as all of you know, that uh, most of those 20 years, as with many of my Chris, uh, classmates, including Chris, um, encompass the wars of 9-11. So um, I happened to be on the crisis of 9-11. I happened to be deployed already to the Middle East. I was one of only a handful of uh, American units that were actually forward at the time. Um, in this case, I was doing a peacekeeping mission called the Multinational Forces and Observer Mission in Egypt that kept uh, an eye on sort of a DMZ between Egypt and Israel. Mm -hmm. Now that Egypt and Israel are more allies, we, we sort of find that funny, but um, that's what the mission was and that's what brought my unit there on 9-11. So mm -hmm. when the attacks occurred, um, I was in charge of security um, as the chief military history, or sorry, military police. Uh, I was also the chief military history guy, but the, uh, as, as the chief uh, military police guy on the ground, um, you're always in charge of security as well as law enforcement. So I was in charge of the security of the base. You know, here we were, one lone unit really in the Middle East when 9-11 went down. So my, my platoon sergeant, the highest ranking enlisted guy, along with myself, I was a first lieutenant at the time, 
uh, had to make some on the fly decisions that our training um, and previous uh, leadership experience and our great soldiers um, sort of allowed us to make on the fly. And really there was mass confusion. Um, I know all of you, most of you probably listening, remember the day and the confusion here, it was no different um, downrange as we say in, in Egypt and getting orders from, you know, the Pentagon was under attack and so on. So in, in the absence of orders, we had to make do and do what leaders do and figure out um, how, to, how to deal with those kind of high pressure situations. So that's one of the things that I did in a, um, you know, in an actual crisis situation. I've been in combat. I was in Afghanistan as a planner, um, but um, fortunately, I uh, didn't really experience any extreme crises while I, I was, uh, you know, there. But had to make um, long-term planning decisions and strategic decisions that, to help the Afghan army. Um, as we helped them plan their campaigns and get their officer corps up to speed. They were very good at fighting, but um, some of the Afghan officers lacked the, um, the, the uh, professional schooling that here in America we uh, are privileged to get. So I did that, and um, I was also uh, chief of police uh, called the Provo Marshal um, in MP circles, um, and I was in charge of a, uh, an area of maybe 15,000 Americans, their families, uh, maybe 3,500 troops or so wow. uh, in Germany, um, and I did that for two years, um, so had to respond to many crisis situations there from, unfortunately, untimely deaths to um, what we suspected was a bio anthrax attack. Fortunately, uh, mm -hmm. that did not turn out to be that. I may not be standing here if yeah. that had been. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, so, you know, that's some of my crisis background. But with that experience, you know, I've sort of um, taken mental notes and thought about, and especially since my retirement, you know, what leadership aspects are uh, handy in a crisis? What should leaders do in a crisis? Um, so I'm going to combine my real world experience with Washington, who to me is still the premier archetypal um, leader of uh, in, in, in history, really. I can't think of one better one. Um, George III, the uh, king um, in England at the time of the American Revolution and after he's known as Mad George because um, they thought perhaps he was a little crazy. But um, he said, Washington, if, he, uh, if Washington uh, gives up power after his second term as uh, president, that he will be the greatest uh, person ever to live. And of course, we know the story that George Washington did, in fact, walk away from power, that he easily could have been the king, easily could have been some sort of tyrant, um, and actually um, proved George III wrong. And what I'm going to tell you about today and speak with you about today is what Washington did previously to prove George III wrong um, and defeat his army um, during uh, the Trenton campaign uh, when all seemed lost during the crisis. And I know um, many of you tuning in might feel the same way um, with the unfortunate 90,000 or so deaths we've had in the U.S., much more, obviously, if you include overseas and, you know, pretty much everyone knows somebody that's been sick. Um, so I hope to at least bring to the table a, historic, a historical perspective um, and a framework, perhaps, for leaders to be able to lead through this crisis that looks like it's going to be with us for a while. If you're if you're watching right now, it's about to get really good. Uh, I've seen I've seen him in action so many times <laughs> on battlefields, walking battlefields like we did at Brandywine and and some other things. And uh, man, this is going to be phenomenal. Uh, man, you know I haven't said this on any of the other ones. You might want to grab some to take notes um, or some. I mean, <laughs> literally just jot this stuff down. Um, I so, appreciate that, Chris. Yeah, it's a high bar to reach because I know. Uh, you know, the other videos are excellent. So um, I'll do my best to uh, at least humbly uh, give the message and uh, hopefully set this framework for leaders. So um, Washington is facing in 1776. So the war has been going on now for about a year to 15 months. Uh, broke out about April 1775. Congress nominates Washington. Um, he's the the logical choice because he's the the, the sole American who has the uh, most leadership experience in the colonies. There's a couple others that have served overseas that have leadership experience, but Washington is served only in the U.S. or well, America, American colonies at the time. 
um, was a regimental commander essentially in the French and Indian War, the earlier French and Indian War, um, as a provincial leader, uh, which was a big deal um, to the colonists. It still didn't merit the respect necessarily um, on the British side, but they at least knew that he was an important person. And he actually saved the day, saved some British units uh, during that war. Um, so Washington in 1776 is facing, you know, what's this crisis? Well, um, he had chased the British out of Boston. The British had regrouped and um, decided to redeploy to America. Um, of course, our most important city at the time, even then, was New York. The capital was in Philadelphia, but the city with the most potential, um, as we see throughout our history, is New York City. So Washington felt that, uh, and correctly, that the British would um, try to take New York City, um, which also meant taking parts of Long Island, um, which would cut the colonies in sort of half if they could control the Hudson River. So the Hudson River obviously uh, empties out near New York City um, and the East River does as well, which runs by uh, the Southern New England, at least Connecticut um, colonies. So Washington is forced without a Navy, uh, um, is facing the premier best military in the world. So essentially he's facing the United States of the time, the United States military of the time. The best Navy by far um, had defeated uh, the French and their allies in the previous, like I mentioned, French and Indian War, seven, uh, called the Seven Years War in Europe. Uh, the best land troops, uh, France had had the best land troops um, previously, but British, the British had um, eclipsed them. And they had German mercenaries that were related to the George family, which was uh, German ultimately. Yeah. Um, so uh, around 20,000 or so soldiers, the biggest armada ever to that time to launch across the ocean a number of ships and, and people to go that far. Mm -hmm. There had been other ones in like uh, the Persian invasion of Greece, for instance, in the near abroad, but to go this far, project power that far across the ocean, never been done before. And Washington's facing this with a motley crew truly of... <laughs> Um, various troops that range from continental, so they, they would be a regular army, uh, different mi militia units, which were sort of untrained farmers that, gra you know, the Minuteman idea, gra grab your musket and, uh, you know, um, run off to the nearest conflict. And then they had state troops as well, um, which are, uh, we, we don't really have an equivalent today of that, something like the National Guard. Um, so Washington is sort of trying to build an army, and we know how hard it is to build an army and to be successful even in our own day with our best army, not, yeah. not always achieving objectives since 9-11. Imagine trying to do this with a motley force wow. uh, and without a Navy. The Navy was essentially pirates. They were called privateers, but they were... <laughs> Um, uh, paid by Con Beat Navy, uh, yeah. but also <laughs> I'll point out to all the Navy fans that you started off as pirates, um, at least in the American sense. Um, nice. So Washington's facing this armada. He has about 15,000, uh, 20,000 uh, troops. Um, the, but again, they're not of high quality and he has to defend, uh, various strong points across Manhattan, Long Island, north of there, which is, you know, part of New York city now, but wasn't, uh, Harlem Heights, the Bronx, mm. um, and so on up to white plains. Um, and he's trying to do this. So ultimately he was outflanked. Um, I don't want to get too much into the details of the, the Long Island. I want to get to the crisis, but, um, Many historians blame Washington for leaving one of his flanks open. That means the side of your force that the enemy could uh, outflank you or turn you, depending on how deep they go, forcing you to fall back or crushing your forces, encircling them and defeating them. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens at the so-called Battle of Long Island, <clears throat> one of the biggest of the war, um, second only to Brandywine, which comes later, um, that Chris mentioned. And Washington's army is almost destroyed in place. It's uh, very lucky. Um, Bismarck once said that, uh, you know, the famous German chancellor once said that uh, God only um, pro protects um, uh, re religious clergy, drunks, and the United States of America. <laughs> and in this case, uh, he was probably right with Washington's uh, luck. Um, the British, although they win the battle, are not able to corner him. And under the cover of darkness over the next uh, night or so, they withdraw the entire army, even though they don't have naval superiority whatsoever, mm. um, under the cover of darkness before the British Navy can cut them off in the East River. And 
what follows that is essentially a series of, of retreats. The British then land from Long Island, they go over to New York, Manhattan, you know, we're probably familiar with that, and drive Washington north through Manhattan, through the Bronx, across the Bronx River. A lot of this is tough terrain, so there's a fighting uh, retreat going on. Washington stopping and uh, trying to delay um, General uh, Howe uh, is leading the British forces and trying to prevent them from basically encircling, using joint operations. They're naval superiority and dominance um, and cutting off essentially the American forces on the, what's essentially a peninsula of sorts. Yeah. Uh, Washington's able to escape. However, he loses a lot of troops on the way. Um, they fight a battle at White Plains. It's a, it's a fairly close battle. The Americans actually do fairly well. The Americans, although they're still trying to build the army, um, are, are fairly adept at fighting from behind uh, fortifications like they did at Bunker Hill or, popularly known as Bunker Hill, but Breed's Hill, really. And they did some of that at Long Island, and they do do some of that at a battle called Harlem Heights, which is a uh, temporary American victory. Uh, but then, again, the British are better trained and have more forces in these certain areas. They're able to uh, use economy of force better than Washington and bring all their forces to bear um, at the point that matters. Uh, right. You could have a lot of forces, but if they're not on the battlefield in place, then they're relatively worthless to you for that particular battle. And that's what General Howe and his well-trained, again, the best army in the world wow. is, uh, is known to do. Um, so things aren't looking well. Uh, New York City, the second biggest, you know, Philadelphia, again, was the biggest at the time, falls to the British. Um, they lose very good terrain. They, they lose a lot of agricultural, not Long Island's not like we imagine it today. It was very agricultural at the time. So they lose those stores. They yeah. lose a lot of weapons and ammunition. Things are not going well. Yeah. So by this point, Washington has about 15,000 guys left. A lot of the guys have been captured, become casualties, deserted. Um, they're still, again, trying to build the army. Um, there's a fight between the, the states because um, again, the Declaration of Independence has been declared in that uh, in early July of 1776. So there's states now. Um, and there's a fight between protecting the states versus doing a federal force to fight the British. So there's that tension there of who's get, who gets the limited resources. Um, and there's two main f uh, forts that uh, still are guarding the Hudson. Um, after all of these reverses, Washington is still in control of what was named after him, Fort Washington. And that's where Washington Heights are uh, yeah. today. For those of you familiar with uh, the northern part of uh, New York City, where the George Washington Bridge goes over, actually. The fort was right there on the uh, New York side. Wow. Um, and then on the other side is Fort Lee in New Jersey, named after Charles Lee, uh, who we'll talk about in a minute, who's one of Washington's subordinates. Um, who actually had the most combat experience, but as I mentioned, he had had his in Europe. So Washington had the most combat experience in America. And Charles Lee was well known as a soldier, and some thought that he actually um, would have been the, the better commander in chief at the time. Um, thankfully, that was not the case, or you know, we would still probably be uh, British Commonwealth at this point. Wow. Um, so you have these two forts um, um, protecting the Hudson River, and uh, there's about 3,000 in each, so about 6,000 guys. And out of 15,000, that's quite a bit out of, out of your force, right? Oh, yeah. um, so there's, you know, um, sort of approaching half the forces uh, that Washington has left are in these two forts. And Washington's gut instinct is, um, I don't think this is a good idea. We should abandon the forts. We can't really stop the British from using the Hudson anyway. What's the point? Yeah. He allows his um, subordinates that he trusts dearly, um, even at this point, uh, trust we'll get back to, um, to talk him out of it and to fight the good fight and hold on to the forts. Well, sure enough, um, Washington's instinct was right. And George, the um, fort named after George Washington fell to the British along with 2,600 plus troops as prisoners, some of his best troops, and a lot of stores that they could not afford to lose. Wow. So right there, he loses about a third of his army. Mm -hmm. He's um, so at this point he's got um, a, about five thousand under Charles Lee further to the north, and he's got a, a couple thousand uh, new, new New England troops north of him, and then uh, his portion of the army is down to about five thousand at this point. 
So they quickly abandoned Fort Lee as well because they saw what the British had just done to their comrades across the river. And this is when the so-called crisis really begins. So he's lost, he was down as it was probably to about half strength and then loses a third of his army um, at Was Fort Washington. And then some of his command is essentially cut off to the north. So and outgunned, he outgunned, outmanned outmaneuvered at this point, beaten on multiple occasions. Exactly. A real crisis. You yeah, know. Dude, um, <laughs> looking good, man. <laughs> exactly. And now again, he's facing the best army in the world. Not only has he been defeated and lost all these resources, but he's actually losing, um, you know, he's losing to the best army in the world that he still has to face and find a way to now beat them with less. Not now they have the morale factor and Washington has the corresponding lack of morale and find a way to salvage this independence movement. So four wow. things were to the point of the talk here where I want you to concentrate on four things that I think I've tried to distill on, you know, applying the history to, to today. Because again, human nature as leaders in a crisis, we're going to come up with the same kind of solutions to crisis problems, even if it's not the exact same. So Jay, what you're, I, th I think what you're setting up here, and I just want to make this point very, very sure. clear for everybody is, all those things were against him. The difference was leadership. The Absolutely. difference in, in the history of our country. Um, yep. So, I mean, it's a very important point. He, Jay's going to break it down into a, 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 you know, an amazing, relatable uh, way that we can apply it today. But I think that's key. Leadership was the difference. I mean, and exactly. it usually is, right, in crisis and, situations. And that's why I'm wearing Washington's T-shirt tonight and not General House T-shirt or George III <laughs> T-shirt or, you know, Washington finds a way, as leaders do during crises, Amen. to pull it out and against all odds um, do what's right and succeed. Wow. And that's what we need to do as leaders during this crisis. Um, so four things that um, reflecting, I've taught, you know, Trent, the, the Trenton campaign, what this becomes, and sort of before that, the retreat through the jerseys. Um, I've taught it many times, but I haven't had a chance to really reflect on it in a leadership way um, in terms of the immediate crisis that we're now dealing with with COVID. Yeah. So I sort of took the knowledge that I had previously and thought about, okay, what's useful to us as leaders today during a, during a crisis? What, how can we frame the problem and deal with it um, using the history of one of the greatest uh, crises that America ever faced? Mm -hmm. So four things jumped out to me. Um, four things that I think Washington excelled at, four things that Washington throughout his uh, long and distinguished career brings to the table repeatedly. Um, so the first one being determination. Um, at this point, facing these odds um, with a ragtag army uh, down 50%, then down another third after losing Fort Washington, having to abandon his supplies, having to abandon the um, excellent uh, crops um, that, that were still growing in the fields uh, during that summer, um, and having to start, start the retreat um, first north and then across the Hudson River with, you know, what's left of his army, about, you know, 5,000 guys or so. So it was his determination to keep the fight going. Um, there's multiple accounts of, you, you, you better believe that um, those of you who have done leadership, especially the military sort, that your subordinates are going to be looking at you in any crisis situation. And that was no different for Washington. He was not a Superman. I certainly don't want to make him out to be one. He was very human like us, made tons of mistakes, dealt with the same kind of human problems that we have, um, made bad decisions, did immoral things. He had slaves, um, which is obviously, you know, an unjust thing at any time period. Um, so not a perfect guy. Um, and he was still able to overcome his personal foibles and personal shortcomings to uh, lead through this crisis. And I, in fact, I think uh, he failed many times before. Um, he had failed um, in the French and Indian War. In fact, there's some new scholarship coming out um, that indicates that Washington personally started the French and Indian War. He actually took the first shot on the Pennsylvania frontier where Chris yeah. is from actually. Yeah. So I'm sure it wasn't far from your house, brother, but yeah. uh, someday, well, if we, if you could avoid the poison ivy, maybe I'll take you out there at some point. Yeah. So. Yeah. Better. <laughs> yeah. Bad childhood memory. <laughs> <laughs> so this determination, the first out of the four points um, is really what helps get him through mm. um, this tough time. He uh, buckles down. He, he doesn't allow panic or fear 
to overcome him. Mm. Uh, he sh shows that he is determined to keep fighting. He could have easily surrendered, try to cut a deal. There were multiple peace offers. In fact, the Howe brothers, the, so there was the General Howe and the Admiral Howe. Um, many scholars think that they actually wanted a negotiated peace and that they were sort of taking their foot off the accelerator at various times. Uh, I don't agree with that view, but that's out there um, that, you know, they, that they weren't um, going full bore. But it is true that they were trying to um, get a settled peace as quickly as possible through battlefield victory, though. Yeah. Um, so Washington would have had to have surrendered, obviously. Yeah. Um, but Washington is determined, even in the face of the best army at that point in the world, the best Navy at that part of the world. I mean, if you could imagine the colonists, their minds are blown that this armada even is able to show up from Europe yeah. uh, in the way that it does, because it's never been done before. Um, and yet Washington is determined to carry on the, the fight. He's got, uh, he's got to deal with governors. Um, again, the governors want their troops back, especially it's sort of a spiral. As leaders, we've seen this happen in dark times where things tend to spiral out of control. One situation leads to another and things start to fall apart, yeah. uh, both personally and with units or whatever your organization is. So um, Washington was determined to overcome that spir spiraling, but he's having to deal with the governors that want their state troops back. They want their uh, militia forces back because now things are out of control and they need to defend their own stuff, their own territory, their own people, their own... Um, you know, independence and way of life as well. So there's that friction. Congress um, is Congress doing politics even at this time. Uh, so Washington's having to deal with Congress, um, but he was brilliant at it. Um, you know, there's many different ways that we could explain his relationship with Congress, but to um, put it down, boil it down is he never lets Congress um, frustrate him to the point of being ineffective. Mm -hmm. He always realizes that um, he is subordinate to Congress. Again, there's no bill president. There's a president of Congress. But at this point, we only have a legislative branch. There's no constitution. So yeah. Congress is king, essentially. Yeah. And Washington, instead of acting like a warlord, which he easily could have, um, is uh, rightly um, giving to Congress as, or, as the law is required. Wow. Um, and plays that extremely well when he could have really, again, gone the warlord route. So I want you to remember determination. The other thing um, that I thought of uh, was daring. Um, is very daring um, individual um, to continue the fight in the face of all odds, um, as we talked about with the, with the determination, but you actually have to act on it. So the acting on the determination is the daring part. So he continues, so he essentially evacuates the Jerseys, New Jersey, they called them the Jerseys at the time, but he, he essentially evacuates New Jersey in 16 days from Fort Lee. Um, so I have a map here. I know it's a little hard to see with uh, the technology that we have, but I'm determined to get through it. Um, you could see Jersey and Fort Washington across the Hudson there. Um, this is our old West Point textbook, by the way, brother. Nice. <laughs> I knew it'd come in handy. Out? Can you point yeah. those out, Jay? So we... Yeah, absolutely. So there's okay. uh, Fort Washington uh, yeah. on, the, on the Hudson. Here's Jersey. Um, and here's Philadelphia. Of course, the largest city in the capital. Um, and there's Trenton. So Washington moves from Fort Lee, which is across the river, the river from War Fort Washington, all the way down to Trenton in 16 wow. days. So this is a fighting withdrawal. He's being harassed. The end, so the way you do um, reconnaissance, the oldest way is one of my military mentors uh, would, would say to me is uh, recon through fire. So you always wanted to stay in literal, literal uh, fire contact with the enemy, meaning you're shooting at them. That's how you rec recon what their intent intentions are. So both Washington and the British are the Washington's uh, rear guard is um, fighting off the vanguard of the British and the Hessians wow. after Fort Lee falls. Um, and now there's also mad panic and crisis going on in the Jersey's people are abandoning property. They're run, they're clogging the roads. Anyone who's been in a combat situation or any sort of uh, natural disaster when everybody's trying to flee an area, that's what it looked like. So consider Jersey looking like sort of a third world country perhaps at this point and, you know, people flocking on the roads, complete chaos. And Washington has 5,000 guys only and is being chased by the most powerful army in, in the world with the most powerful, Navy. Washington has no Navy. Jersey has a long coast, right? So yeah. British could really land at will any place that they wanted that had a, a port to set their ships in wow. and, um, and try to cut them off. 
So he's dealing with all these issues. He's dealing with Congress. He's dealing with um, the governors. He's dealing with his own soldiers. So what happens, it takes really, all of that scenario takes through the fall. Um, the fighting at White Plains, the abandoning of the forts, or losing Fort Washington, abandoning Fort Lee, mm. the 16 days to evacuate Jersey. Um, so really it's happening through the fall and the early winter. And uh, Wa- Washington ends up, uh, or at least winter weather, uh, Washington ends up um, across the river. He makes it out. And he's at some points, he is personally leading the engineers to destroy bridges and uh, cut down trees and dig ditches to try to slow the British down so he could get the rest of his army out. Um, he's also trying to get Charles Lee, his, um, the leader of another force of about 5,000 guys, uh, who has the most military experience, but is a, what Washington easily could have been. Um, he's the guy that George III actually was describing when he said, you know, he'd be the greatest guy to give up power. Lee would not have given up power. He would have been a warlord. Um, not, not the greatest guy, although he did have a lot of combat experience and he's disobeying Washington's orders, even though at this point he's got about half of the entire regular army under his command and fails to join up with Washington. So he goes to Morris, uh, town, Basking Ridge area of Jersey, sort of up in the high grounds. And he's up there with his 5,000 guys. Washington is trying to delay the British as I just showed you on the map. And he's also trying to get some other um, American forces to join up um, so he could um, have a larger force to deal with the um, 10 to 15,000 British that are bearing down on him. Um, Daringly continues the fight, again, determination and daring, gets across the river, um, the Delaware River, um, uh, goes through Trenton, takes everything that they can uh, that's useful, um, and the smart thing he did was he cleared the Delaware River of boats besides the ones under his personal command. So that meant the British could no longer chase him across the river. They were going to have to stop and at least build new boats. Wow. Um, so that was a very uh, daring and innovative idea. Um, so we're going to talk about innovation as well here um, as, one of the, as the third point. Um, now it's wintertime. Washington's troops... I've lost their supplies. Um, there's multiple accounts of barefoot soldiers. Um, they literally have no supplies because there's no operating logistics system like we have today. I mean, the country is brand new. Um, they're begging for supplies from the states and so on. There's no like industry to turn to to produce um, PPE, like we're saying in COVID, or produce antibody tests or produce you know whatever COVID tests. There, yeah. There's no there's no industrial act because there's no industry really. So they're begging um, to try to get supplies. The troops are literally freezing. People, uh, some of his soldiers, literally froze to death it, it, during the march. They'd fall over frozen and, wow. and dead. Um, so that's the kind of crisis that he's facing here. And this is when Thomas Paine in Newark um, during, during the retreat in Newark, New Jersey, uh, pens the crisis, which becomes the famous, you know, this is the time that, you know, real men and women and children uh, rally to the cause and have the determination, daring, innovation, and trust the four things I want to talk about in, in totality to see, see this through. Wow. And this pamphlet goes crazy. It's sort of like social media today. Um, every household gets it. They read it to the army. Um, and that does inspire a lot of troops. It doesn't help Washington's situation totally, though, because now he's isolated across the Delaware River. Um, he has some boats with him. He doesn't have his whole army together. He's only got about 5,000 guys, um, the, the survivors of the march, so probably a little bit less of the 5,000. They're freezing. And on top of all that, the enlistments are up. So they've only enlisted through the new year. Um, so he will only have 1,500 guys left to face uh, house 20,000 in total across the Jerseys and into New York um, if by fr- 1 January something doesn't ch- uh, change. Uh, Congress has abandoned Philadelphia. They go to Baltimore at this point because they're afraid. There's nothing between the British Army and them. No. Um, and as George III has said, there he will hang all of them at this point if they don't um, surrender. And, you know, it was – has the time gone up where you're going to be hanged or not? So Ben Franklin gives that, you know, famous quote, a quip about, you know, we will um, hang, we should hang together because assuredly we will all hang separately. So (laughs) in other words, this was the time to rally together. Um, So in the daring under this crisis, what does Washington decide to do? To attack. He decides (laughs) to attack. 
that's why I love, love the guy. I mean, if I could think of any um, truly American thing, that's why I'm wearing the, the t-shirt that says get some on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, Jay, of- that reminds me of a, <laughs> a saying that we heard many times in our military careers is take the fight to the enemy. That's right? exactly what he does here, Chris. People sitting, people sitting, you know, and kind of letting COVID and the situation come to them. Take this as a rallying point, a cry to, Take the fight to the enemy. You're not That's sunk, man. You can go out there. You can turn new business. You can recreate yourself. You can rebrand. You can go find additional things. Um, take right. the fight to the enemy, man. And I think that's what we're trying to do right now, right? We're trying. We're determined as a group under diligent plans, under your excellent leadership, to try to do something about it. Amen. We're just not cowering in our house by ourselves. We're trying to give back to the community and uh, help frame perhaps a useful uh, leadership framework to get us through this crisis. So exactly that. And that's what Washington does. He goes out and gets some in military terminology, takes the fight literally to the enemy. Um, What daring. So at this point, how um, thinks the war is over. He's already taking uh, 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 folks coming back. Um, Some of this was covered in various um, uh, shows like turn you know and uh turner classic movies or whatever um so yeah it's out there you could probably see it on social media but the jerseys are going back most of the people in new jersey are taking uh, oath of loyalty back to the crown um so what how does like any european commander he goes into winter quarters and the reason you do that is not because the soldiers are too weak to fight in the winter it's because you can't feed the horses on fodder especially in a colonial setting Uh um where, where there's not a lot of storage for horses. Uh, European bred horses require a ton of um, forage every day um, to, to draw the supply wagons, to draw the artillery caissons, to draw the a- ammunition caissons for the artillery and so on. Yeah. Um, officers are riding horses and you have, so there is some cavalry and dragoons, mounted soldiers um, in, in America. So, what you do is you spread out a little bit so you can live off the land and you go into winter quarters. And that's what, how it does. He thinks the war is over the army. Oh, and they've also captured Charles Lee at this point, uh, you know, cause he was being so arrogant. He decided to not use security, right? Security is something that leaders always think about. Um, and he's captured and put away. And um, fortunately most of his force escapes and rejoins Washington. So Washington has a temporary increase of forces. So he's got about 6,000 guys now and he's going to do something very daring. He's going to, um, so he's shown his determination to stay in the fight. Now he's going to do the daring piece, which is cross the frozen river, half frozen. It would have been better actually if it was totally frozen because he could have walked across the Delaware actually back then would freeze completely over. It was still during the mini ice age. It was a lot colder in uh, the Americas at the time. And uh, even the artillery could have been pulled across, but it, it, um, because it was Christmas Day when they got going, um, they were unable to uh, use, the, it hadn't frozen enough yet. So they had to use the boats that Washington collected. Wow. So he's taking this ragtag army and um, using good intelligence um, that some of the militia forces had brought in. And due to the poor behavior, which is a different story of the British and the Hessians, there were supposed depredations against the locals, which, you know, is it rumor, what's fact, what's not. Yeah. Uh, you know, the bottom line is military practitioner or leaders, you have to deal with uh, perceptions a lot of time. Even if it's not fact, it's still a perception, it's still real. And that's what Washington is able to get intelligence, because the perception is that these depredations have been committed against the colonists who have just gone back over to the crown. Wow. So he gets his boats together. Again, his army is literally freezing. There's, you could trace the army because the soldiers' feet are bleeding because they're wrapped in rags or nothing. They're just going barefoot on the ice and the snow, yes. uh, literally marching uh, that, that, that way. Um, they get in these, uh, they're called uh, Dunham boats. They're these sort of flat bottom uh, ba- uh, sort of bateau boats that are common in the Americas. And they're wide bottom boats. And you actually use poles to pull yourself across the river. Mm. Um, so you're not even really oaring you're sort of uh, pulling yourself um, with poles across and he has some trained units that know how to use these boats from Rhode Island Yeah, that the same guys that saved him on Long Island and they got the army off to Manhattan 
um, get the army back across the Delaware. And there's floating debris. I mean, that's what the, the shirt, the famous painting is about. Washington on the bow of the boat, showing daring, showing determination to get his army back across and fight this isolated garrison. So he finds this isolated garrison of Hessians due to the intelligence at Trenton. This is the famous battle of Trenton, the Trenton campaign, perhaps. And um, they're, they're not expecting a, a major attack, but they're also not uh, drunk as most of the American history says that they've been partying for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and that they're all sort of hung over. Yeah. Uh, you know, Chris and I don't know what that feels like. Not but, at all. Um, <laughs> they, uh, it's actually not the case. They had uh, units under arms throughout the whole day. They had pickets out. They did basically everything a good, good units would do. Yeah, so Wall right. has about three regiments with him, you know, anywhere from two to 3000 guys. He's the, the Hessian commander there. Um, and Washington's got, uh, about, about as many, but he has the element of surprise. He's gotten perhaps a little bit more and he has more cannon. Um, so he's able to get this ragtag force across the river somehow, which in itself is a miracle. There's yes. accounts of the American officers uh, on the boats and afterwards saying, you know, we've lost the element of surprise because the ice flows made it harder to cross the river. So by the time they got across the river and marched the nine miles to Trenton, they lost the element of surprise, which we know in a military operation, especially facing the best troops in the world. Um, could be fatal. And most of the officers thought it was over. But again, it was Washington's determination and daring. He actually got letters from some of his subordinates saying, hey, boss, uh, don't you think we ought to retreat? We've lost the element of surprise. It's going to be daytime by the time we uh, get together, assemble and get into the attack. But Washington says no. In fact, the, uh, the password of the day, um, the challenge and password um, was uh, uh, liberty or death. So liter uh, liberty, liberty, uh, give me death. Wow. Yeah. So they were going to no, no, no matter what, um, make it across the river, and um, it was really Washington carried the army on his back at this point to uh, to to do so. Um, so very daring. He finds an isolated garrison. He puts the river to his back, which is not you know necessarily a smart military move. Um, he's facing the great forces, and, and and they're also prepared. They're under arms and ready to fight. Um, but yet he is able to um, uh, divide his force, which is also daring in the face of a superior uh, enemy. Even though Washington has the numbers, the Hessians are better soldiers than he has yeah. uh, and is able to use innovation. So that's the third point I want to talk about. Um, we've talked about determination to carry on the fight in a crisis. We've talked about daring to do things and keep momentum and initiative going in a crisis. And now we're going to talk about innovation. So it was uh, customary at the time to keep your artillery uh, separated out uh, with the infantry units. So instead of massing your artillery, you would uh, send it out separately to support the infantry. Well, Washington has a very innovative commander that he supports under Henry Knox, who's in charge of the artillery. In fact, he had been a bookseller um, in New England previously, and here he is now as the commander of artillery for this wow. rebel army, the way the British look at it. Um, and he innovates. You know, he's not bound by any sort of tradition or he's not afraid to go back to, you know, in the case of a British officer, if they don't follow the regulations or whatever, go back and face something. He's going to try to innovate um, in a very revolutionary way for this uh, for this rebellion. And he masses his few guns. He has 18 guns on the march well. and uh, um, actually masses them uh, in, in such a way that he prevents the, the Hessian infantry attacks from, from materializing and causes a lot of casualties. And then at this point, the American infantry are filling into the houses of Trenton and taking pot shots at the, Brit or at the Hessian soldiers as they're trying to um, rally together, uh, coming out under arms um, from, from their dwellings. Um, but it's too late. Washington does actually maintain, there was a snowstorm, a bit of a snow squall that helped cover some of his movements. And they were able to move so rapidly in the attack that they caught the Hessians before they could fully deploy. And they end up defeating them in this battle of Trenton piecemeal. So half of Washington's force def defeats one regiment, another half defeats another regiment to, you know, regiments about a thousand guys or so. Yeah. They're probably down to about 800 uh, for the Hessians at this point, just due to campaigning and sick, the sick and so on. 
Um, and then the, th the, the third regiment sort of uh, peters out um, and is not able to get it going when the other two regiments collapse. And Washington has a very good plan. He's surrounded the town. He's cut off uh, lines of communication to potential um, nearby garrisons uh, at New Brunswick, at Princeton, now where the university is, um, and, uh, and other strongholds of the Hessians and British in, um, in Jersey. So Washington, through innovation, um, massing, having Knox mass the artillery using sort of a very lightning attack um, is able to not, not sort of obeying the doctrine of war at the time. Um, he's doing something a little different with technology in this mm. case, um, is able to, um, is able to win the battle and defeat a much superior force in terms of fighting ability and to find this isolated garrison to get a win. And again, the, the win was important to keep the crisis from totally spiraling out of control. Like we're facing now with uh, COVID we got as leaders, perhaps the idea here is to innovate enough where you could get some wins. Um, and not, you know, focus everything on the negative. So it yeah. caused the enlistments not to, a lot of the people decided to re-enlist because they, they saw that through the victory, the war was not a lost cause. They, they weren't willing to enlist again to just become British prisoners. But now that Washington had demonstrated that the fight was still on, um, he was able to convince um, a lot of his uh, soldiers to re-enlist. He got more support in many ways, huh? Give him, give him some hope and exactly. Give him hope like through. Atlas, right? So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's another great point too, right? So you got to get the hope going. So through determination, daring, and innovation, during this crisis, Washington is able to uh, keep the hope, keep the hope alive. Yeah. Um, so the fourth point I wanted to talk to, and you know, sort of wrap up uh, things here, is trust. So Washington, even though he had trusted his leaders, if you remember, we talked about before, he trusted his leaders, uh, in this case, Nathaniel Green, who ends up being his best subordinate in the war. Um, he trusts him at Fort Washington when Green tells him to keep the fort. And of course, that was a disaster and they lost close to 3,000 guys and all the supplies and you know the story. Um, but he maintained his trust of Green. His trust was un unwavering, and he saw the talent in Green, who himself was a you know not a military guy, was a Quaker sort of um, just an average guy before the war. Yeah, but Washington, and I've noticed this with some uh, you know, brilliant leaders in both mi the military and business. General Petraeus springs to mind. Um, no talent, they recognize talent. That is part of their talent is that they recognize other talent. Wow, and Washington, what a, great, um, what a great leader trait. Yep, exactly. In this case, Washington, he finds Knox again, like a guy that you would not, no military background. He finds Green, no military back. These are self-taught guys. Um, and he finds the, and cultivates them. Now he doesn't just find them and sort of put them on a task and ignore, ignore them. He um, goes on throughout the war to cultivate this talent. So in Green's case, even though it starts off kind of shaky, Green doesn't do a great job. Washington still trusts him. And Green actually is commanding one of the wings of Washington's force at Trenton. So he could have fired him. He could have, how many leaders today during the COVID crisis would make their subordinates take the blame? You know, we see this through government. We see this in the military, unfortunately, sometimes. We see this in business. You know, I'm not going to take the blame. I'm going to blame my chief subordinate. And Washington could have done that, much to the detriment of the American cause. Wow. What he does instead um, is he um, develops Green's talent. Um, through this trust, um, he, he makes him uh, later on in the war, he makes him his chief supply guy, a brandy wine that you and I have uh, walked around the battlefield. Um, if you remember, Green had just been the uh, supply guy um, and didn't like it. <clears throat> or he was about to be the supply guy and, and uh, didn't like it in Valley Forge. But Washington did that on purpose because he wanted, he was, what he was doing was cultivating Green, Nathaniel Green, to take department command without Washington around to look over his shoulder. Mm. So he had the trust in his subordinate to develop him. Um, and in fact, Green is the one who wins the South more or less for the Americans at the later part of the war. So Washington was a very good judge of character, very uh, knowledgeable when it came to talent management, as we would call it today, and had the trust to find the leaders and to believe that they could get the job done and not micromanage them. Wow. Uh, so that's the fourth point I wanted to leave you with during this crisis, trust other people to help you do the job. It's not just you that has to be determined, daring, innovative. 
it could be, you know, others within your organization. It should be if you've done your job as the, you know, senior leader um, to find that talent, to cultivate that talent. And if the person is not in the right role, to be the responsible one and move them to a role where they can succeed. Something else I learned during my career is, um, and I, in fact, I talked about this a little bit during my retirement talk. Um, I, I've run across almost no soldiers, maybe one or two that had real serious issues of, 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 of a kind, but a lot of the thousands that I've um, had the pleasure of leading and commanding, and they've led me as well in uh, sort of reverse leadership leading up the chain. Um, there's been very few, uh, again, uh, less than a handful that um, were not good at anything. Wow. So if you take the time to really know your people in your organization during this crisis, you will find that um, they will surprise you in many ways. It's a matter, that's what leaders do. You put the um, person's skills and attributes and characteristics to the task, not the other way around. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we often forget that because we hire somebody into a job. We think that he's locked in. Oh, wait, I hired him to do this. Well, you know, if the person's not cut out to do this, people are a lot more than a resume. They're a lot more than an online application. Jay, let me um, make a point there. That was such a yeah, great yeah. point. I'm so glad you said that. So companies nowadays, right, they'll hire somebody for, for a position, like you said, and it doesn't work out. And guess who they blame? They blame the employee. And they should take responsibility and say, well, you know what? We probably didn't manage talent well enough to put you in a position to best serve your traits. They should take responsibility and say, you know, we hired you for this, but why don't we move you over here? Because part of our responsibility is to get you in a position that you can be successful. Instead, a lot of companies are just like, oh, yeah, you're not working out. Yeah. Oh, and God, think so. about what's lost in that, right? As a leader, I mean, think about when you hire employees, you know, you've just lost all those manpower hours to hire the guy, to fire the guy, to go through the HR processes, um, to, to pay them, you know, to uh, give them severance or whatever. You've yeah. just wasted all of that as a leader in your business um, by simply not finding, you know, what they're good at by exercising good leadership. And sometimes it's hard because there's feelings involved, emotions involved, people are embarrassed. They may, you know, may not be good at what you hired them to do. That's what we as the leader have to have trust, like Washington demonstrated at Trenton and elsewhere to um, trust ourselves that we made the right choice, but also to trust in that person that they have something to bring to the table. Yeah. Um, the other part of that is giving them the training that they need. So as I mentioned with Nathaniel Green, Washington trusted him, but he just didn't leave it at that. He made sure that he got the training um, during the Valley Forge that came later when the army was also freezing and hungry. He made Green the head of logistics to train him for the new role. So if we're going to put people as leaders in roles, especially during COVID crisis management, um, we have to make sure that we give them the training along with the responsibility. If you give them just the responsibility, chances are they're not going to make it or it's 50, 50. Right. Oh. But if you give them the training and the responsibility and back them up with the trust, they more, more likely than not will succeed. That's such a great, uh, great, another, a great, another great example of, uh, you know, like, like love people say, Oh, I love you. I love you, bro. I love you, you know, honey or whatever. Love's an action. Word. I, do, I do love you, bro. So. Well, yeah, <laughs> right back at you, man. Um, but, but you know what? You've been there for me and I've been there for you. Love's an action word. And, and trust is an action word. You know, it's, it's an action word. Does it, oh yeah, I trust you. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to give you responsibility. I'm going to give you training. It's action. So I, love that. I, I heard you mention that in a, in a video and I thought about it. I think that that's a great point. I'm so glad you mentioned that. It's yeah, you actually as a leader have to do something. It takes action takes agency to do it. So yeah. again, the, uh, you know, again, the password for the night, I think I said liberty or death, it's a victory or death is what it was. I mean, you could think about, you know, to get that trust ingrained in people, victory or death, this yeah. is what the stakes are. I trust you that you're going to do your job and I'm going to, as the leader, as Washington, put you in position to um, succeed, um, victory or death. So can't think of a better way to end the talk. <laughs> yeah. but I'm happy to happy to, to discuss you know the the uh, points again you know we covered determination daring innovation and trust so look to that during this crisis um, just as Washington did as a as with typical Jay Warren style not only we got four main points but we got about 500 sub points that <laughs> any one of those we could have gone off on and, and talked about but uh Jay Absolutely. this was value I always get pumped up when I hear you man once my 
my uh, slower cerebral processing gets behind everything you're saying and I start to see the, the clear picture because your depth of knowledge is so amazing. Once I see it, man, I get pumped up, man. These are actionable uh, leadership behaviors, traits, decisions, whatever you want to call them that you can apply to your teams as, as crisis leaders right now. And by the way, if you don't label yourself as a crisis leader, if you're a leader, we are in crisis. Therefore you are a crisis leader. So <laughs> go apply, apply, <laughs> apply just in case no one's told you that you're a crisis leader right now. Um, I mean. And it's up to you, you know, like Jay said, have a rally and cry, man, victory or death. And you know what? Death's not an option. Let's, let's take these teams and take them through this crisis on the victory onto a brighter future. Um, try right. plant, plant your flag, plant your flags, plant rally flag. the troops to the flag and, you know, set out to, to, to do best during this, during this crisis, man. Jay, this has been uh, an honor and a pleasure as I knew it would be. Um, it was great. I'm glad, so glad for the opportunity to, you know, at least try to help a little bit. Hopefully something was said that, you know, could be of use to leaders out there. I'd be happy to take, you know, offline uh, follow-ups. Yeah, in fact, glad you mentioned that. Uh, you can find more about Jay at the Diligent Plans website. There's, he's one of our uh, uh, Diligent speakers. Um, you can bring Jay out to your organization, maybe virtually at this, at this time, uh, but he's a, available for that. Um, and he is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, also, you can find him on LinkedIn, and I'll put his LinkedIn handle down below us here in the video so you can find him on LinkedIn as well. Um, but wow. This has been great, man. I appreciate you, brother, and I'm I'm glad like you have a heart to serve. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the, the opportunity to, to, to do this. Um, I really appreciate what, what you're doing, and you're the one that motivated me um, and, you know, um, allowed me to get some determination based on this program. So, uh, I appreciate it. I think a big part of uh, getting through times like this is the company you keep, and I'm, I'm glad you're in my circle, bro. Likewise, brother. Thanks again. Thanks, Jay.